right? But a lot of those can be handled through parameters. Make sense? Okay. All right, so let's make our own piece. You ready to make your own triangular? So what they don't give you is the butterfly truss, right? It's the triangular truss that's in three dimensions. So kind of what we did last week with the massing. Remember that? Let's do that as if we, because what, what we can't do with the one we did last week <coughs> is that we can't load it into a beam system. It's not going to operate in Revit. It's not going to tag with a structural tag, right? It's kind of this one-off, really sculptural truss. But what if we want to have something more along the lines of that, but more applicable to real life, right? I would build this into my own family. So let's go ahead and build that out. So I'm going to go ahead and go file new family. Make sure on the imperial side. Oh my god, class. Jeez, man. God forbid, dude. All right, and then I'm going to pick. So there's some things I can pick. So what I do is when I'm doing, I can think of it as, let's look at each one of these families. So we're going to make our own trust, right? So I have a structural trust family. I have a complex and complex trust family, and then I have beams and braces. So let's open all three of those and take a look at those. So let's look at the beams and braces one first. All right, so if I was going to make my own custom beam, so we'll see that I kind of have a template laid out for me. Right, so this is similar to your generic modeling template. I have all my modeling tools available to me. If I go to 3D, right, it's, they're going to give me a simple box to begin with. I would delete that box off and begin drawing my own. And then the reason why we see that gap when we, when we laid out our girders is because of this right here. So in the event that I wanted that gap to go away, I would edit that family and drag that all the way to the end. And then that would get rid of that gap. So that's where that is. That's only going to allow me like an extrusion or a sweep pattern. Really not too much um, three-dimensional sense I can get out of that. I could, but it might take a little while. But I'll leave it open in case we want to do it on that one. And then I'm going to go ahead and go new family. And I'm doing this because some things have changed since I've last done this. So, so I'm also looking while I'm going through here what you would be doing on your own, figuring out which one's the right one. And I'll say, okay, let's look at the let's look at the, the trusses one next. Because complex and trusses, I believe, is the only one. So on this one, I'm looking at a structural level one plan. I see my struct I have two parameters already for me. I have my truss length, and then I have my truss height. Now the problem with this being is I want to be able to load my custom truss into a beam system, right? So this isn't gonna allow me to load that into a truss system. Okay? That's a big, 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 big problem. So I'm going to say no to the trust system. I'm still, I'm still here, right? I'm still liking this idea. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and go new, family, and then I'll look at the complex and trust. So I'm, I'm thinking because it has the word trust in it, that I'm not going to be able to use that one either, but we'll still look at it and see what it, what it gives us out of the box. And then this just gives me nothing, right? This is like my generic model. The only thing, the only difference between this one and a generic model is if I go to my family category and types, it's tagged as structural framing. So that will work for me because now I have an object that's tagged as structural framing. If I had it tagged under here as, as, as structural truss, it's not going to load into the beam system, right? So knowing that I want to, and actually, let's, let's double check that. So I'll leave that one open. I'm going to go back to the last one and just, just double check myself. And let's look at its category. Ha. Ah. So it has one category. This is why, because this was like an add-on in Revit later on, like I think 2012 is when they added the ability to do trusses. And there's one category of trusses. Trusses cannot be loaded into beam systems. So there's my decision made. I'm going to do the one that's just out of the box different. I like being different. 
So let's close this one. And that one will keep open. Oh, I, I, I shouldn't have done that. Close that one. Close that one. Nope. Ah, uh, Jesus. All right. Here we go. Fun, fun, fun. So I, I am notorious. I've been yelled at this too many times today. Close hidden windows. So right now I have so many windows open, right? So what I can do is this little button at the top says close hidden windows. And I'll just go ahead and make that open. And then I should be able to close my hidden windows, which I have none. Okay. Then I'll go ahead and make that last final new family and do it as truss. Structural truss. Beams and braces. What was it again? Complex and trusses. Let's go ahead and open that up. So there we go. So it's basically like a generic modeling family. Only the only difference is, is that I categorized it as a structural framing. And I could have done this with a generic model family too. So let's go ahead and begin making our own custom truss here. So I know that I'm going to have a length and a width in plan. So I'll go ahead and do RP for reference plane. RP for reference plane this way. I'm going to have a depth, okay, and then if I go to my elevation, I'm going to have a height, okay, and then I may have division spacings of this. Okay. Right, so while I'm in this, this is going to be the division of my, my truss, right? So I'll do uh, DI for distance. Make those equivalent. Then I'll put an overall length on this. Length of truss, add parameter, call it length. And then I'll do DI and I'll give it a depth. <laughs> metric, oh I love metric. Okay. And then I'll go into my um, floor plan, and in my floor plan, I know that I've already defined length and width, so I'll then on this one I'll do, I'll do my width on this one. Add parameter. All right, so if I go to, this is going to be a three-dimensional truss, right? So if I go to 3D, a lot of this work's going to have to be done in three dimensions. When I do that, I don't see anything in three dimensions. Big, 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 big problem, right? So how do I see my reference lines in three dimensions? What I need to do now is now that I have my grid kind of laid out and penciled out for this, is I need to lay reference lines over my geometry. So go to Create. And I'll do reference line instead of reference plane. And I'm going to begin penciling out my grid for this. And I may, I'm going to make it so that each one of these is like this. So I'm going to actually draw in each one and lock it. Now you may have a better way of doing this. I'm going to actually sit here and go one by one. And I'm going to create all kinds of little lock buttons and confuse myself. See how good my eyes are today. What is the difference between grid lines? Grid, uh, grid reference planes are going to carry, they're like, uh, anybody draw like a ray? We don't even use rays in AutoCAD anymore, but a ray is infinite, right? It's going into X, Y, Z space infinitely. Right? And that's why I can't see it in three dimensions. A reference line is, is a finite point between two reference planes. So if I needed to do anything angular, I need to use a reference line. Because I can't say, if I tried to snap a reference plane, right, I can do that. right, And I have a reference plane between there. But when I stretch this, it doesn't stay connected. So the only way to get that angular element to stay connected is to draw a reference line. So if I do a reference line, 
I can now have an angular function that stretches. Make sense? And that's where I'm leading into with this. So then I'm going to finish out the bottom element of this. So again, reference line. So yeah, then you're going to get things that over constrain and all kinds of good stuff here. So we're going to have fun with this one. See all these locks? It just gets crazy, man. Crazy. So in the event that you get that, right, we just want to go ahead and start moving this and seeing what, why it's doing what it's doing. Build them. And then if, it, if anything breaks, we then go back and align it. In this case, I've already got all those laid out, so that's probably why it's doing it. So I'll be doing reference lines, just single lines. So I'll do one, and I'll do another one, and I'll do one, and I'll do another one, and I'll do one. And then I'm kind of arbitrarily placing it because I'm going to end up aligning it anyway. All right, it can be sideways when I place it. Then I do AL for a line. Click on my reference plane, lock it, lock it, lock it, lock it, lock that one, lock that one. And then I'll make sure that my endpoints then snap to my ends. Make sure there's no locks coming up. And you'll see by doing it this way, I avoid my, my over-constrained sketch. So it's, it's funny that they call it a sketch, too, because that's my analogy for how these are working. I'm sketching out my skeleton before I make my geometry. I'll go to 3D. There we go. So by doing that, I can now see my, my grid happening in three dimensions. So the next part of this is I need to now begin building um, geometry in, in basically, yeah, in three dimensions. So how I do this is I'm going to go ahead and do my line, my reference line command. But before I do that, I want, I need to get this same line that's in the center line, or actually the end lines to go all the way up to the top. So that's why I'm doing this this way, is I'm going to set my, my reference plane to be at the bottom of each one of these. Why is that? I don't want conduit. So I'll click on set, and then I'm going to pick a plane. When I pick my plane, I'm going to pick on my points, right? So I want there to be my reference plane. And then actually I'm drawing in the vertical, so it's got to be a sideways one. So I'll set, pick a plane, and I'll pick on this side. So that one's going vertical. And I'm going to draw in my reference line going vertical. It should be giving me the ability here to go vertical with that. And then I can copy that to each one of my lines. And then I can't, since I'm in that plane, I can't go to the other side and do this. So now that I have those, I need to do it again on the other side. So I'll create reference line. And before I do that, I need to set my work plane on the other side. So I'll tap through. I'm going to do a reference line, and that's going to go then vertical again. And we're going to snap these to, to the height geometry, so it doesn't matter how tall they go right now. I'm going to copy that over. That's that. Then I'm going to go in and I'm going to try and flex it. So hopefully it doesn't break when I flex it because I don't want to do that again. So I'll make that like 6,000 and just check it. Hey, all right. Some of them did, some of them didn't. So, right, so this is the point of flexing the model. Those stuck, this one didn't. So then I would drag that over to my point and I see my lock. Drag that over to my point, see my lock. So what would be another way I could do this, right, is because I've already drawn this in, in one elevation. 
So I'm going to come in and instead of going in in three dimension and trying to lock this each time, just delete off what I did. Do, 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 do. Oh, Revit, how I heart you. I'll build one elevation and then copy that over. So I have one elevation. I can do two elevations. So I'm in my front. I'll go ahead and create reference line. And then this one, I'll draw there. Draw there. And I can even be doing this in a rectangular form. So it even it gives me my locks. So I'll do that. Got my locks. And I'm doing every other one because I know there's going to be overlap. And four. And then I'll fill in the gap on those two. So I'll go ahead and create reference line. Gap filled, locked, and no other locks there. Lock that one. Lock that one. All right, and I'll just make sure that those are aligned where they need to be. Tab through. Yeah, we'll flex it and see if they stick. Hopefully they stick. Make that 8,000. And then we'll do width. Oh, yeah, width or depth. We'll do depth. Depth is 2,000. So top and bottom. Flex. Click apply. Hey, hey, all right. So I missed the last one, so we'll do the last one. Now I'll lock that, and that should do that side. So then I'll go to 3D and I'll look at what I have. So that's actually loading it right, right at that center point. So that, I think that's fine. We're just going to build it inverted, right? If I needed to do it, if I needed to do it the other way, I can do it the other way. I'm not even so we'll do it inverted. So it's an inverted butterfly. Right? So then once I have my, my three-dimensional kind of cage built, um, and I have something, I had a student do Waterloo Station with the finger joint truss, where one goes into the other one. Uh, Werner Sobeck, he built like this three-dimensional cage like this, and we were able to make Waterloo like really big and really wide. It was really kind of sweet. So. So if, we, if somebody wants to see that, I can show you that later. So I'm going to go ahead and now start connecting these lines. So I'll create reference line. And then I want to go ahead and I need to now set, begin setting my work planes accordingly. So this one, I need to make a triangular truss or triangular element right there. So I'll go ahead and set my work plane. This is set so tedious sometimes. If somebody else has already built it, you want to try and use their content if you can. So do reference line, and then I can draw up to there. And then I need to do the other side. Hopefully I can do the other side when I do this. There. Now lock it. And make sure each one's locked. So then, once I do each one, I have to come in, and I have to flex my length to make sure that it's sticking together. And it is. We'll take our depth, make sure that's sticking together, and it's not. So that's why we do that. So then, then I have to come in, and each one of these, I have to drag down, and then you'll see I get my little lock. And then I get my lock. And it's already locked. So now I'll flex it one last time. I'm going to set up new, a new family type so I can do my test cases. Test A, new test B, because I'm going to be doing this quite a bit. One's at 8,000 by 4,000. Test A is test A. Test A, test B. So let's go to test B. And it didn't lock again. Oh, yeah, yeah. So when I do this, I need to make sure that I'm locking to the right element. So there's my lock there. Drag that one up. Should get my lock here. If I do AL, I might be able to align that. 
and I'm going to tab through, try and grab the end piece to that one, then I get my lock button. So in the event that you can't get the point to snap, you need to use your align tool to get that to snap. Okay. And then I'll do my test case to check that. Click apply, click OK. Check it, oh, I didn't switch it. Test A. Come on, baby. Hey, 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 there we go. TL for thin line so I can see. So now that one's stuck, right? So I would need to go into each one of these. So I'm not gonna do each one, I'm gonna do three. All right, because I don't wanna have to do that every time. So I'll go ahead and set my work plane on the middle one. No, if I just caught, there's, because I'm striking it, it's constrained to actual points in the system. I can't just copy it. I wish you could just copy it, that'd be awesome. I'd be loving life right now. So I need to click and then drag up to my point. And you'll see that little lock comes up, but there's no easy way to get that thing to lock. So I need to drag it down and then drag it off and lock it. And then I'll do the other side. So that's where I want to be. Hey, I actually got him to lock. So now that one's locked, the other one didn't lock. We'll do our test case. Test B, click apply. Click OK. Yeah, there we go. Now we're cooking. All right, so let's do the last one. Pick plane. Tap through. Reference line. To two. That one didn't allow me to draw my block. Yeah, so once you do this once or twice, I think you probably get it into a rhythm with it and figure out what it's looking for. There, click, click, and then I'll flex it again. Hey, cool. Okay, that's that one. So now the last part is to build the three-dimensional set of this, right? So somehow, some way, I need to get from that point to that point. So how the heck am I gonna get to that point? I don't know. I haven't figured that out. Um, so let's figure it out. So I could go this way. Let's see if I can do a model line. So if I do a model line, I still can't do my three-dimensional snapping. How are we going to do that one? Hmm, anybody got any ideas? I know how I do it. Okay, so... Remember we talked on angles, so I need a reference plane that goes on that angle, right? So I'm going to go ahead and create a reference line that goes from that point, and really, I, yeah, I want it from that point to that point. And then I want another one that goes from the other point to the other point. And then we'll flex it. And then it's stuck. And really, I wanted it to go the other way. Duh. Dummy. All right, so let's go ahead and create reference line again. It really needs to go from there to there. There to there. Look at all those locks, man. Holy cow. To there. And then from there. Oh, from there to there. From there to there. Okay. Then I'll flex it and check it. Woohoo, I love it when that works. Okay, so now I have a reference plane that goes in that, that um, kind of area. That's where I want it to go from point A to point B. Even though it's angular in three dimensions and in the XYZ, I can still set up an orthogonal work plane to work on with that. So I'll go ahead and set my work plane, pick a plane, tab through is there. Now, if I want to make a reference line, I can do a reference line from that point to that point. And then I definitely want to make sure that this is locked because I don't want to have to do this twice. Lock that one. And then we'll flex it. 
So I check my work to make sure that's what I want. And you'll see what happens, right? It still doesn't stick. Oh, Revit. Oops. Drag that down to there. Locked. So let's try flexing it one last time. Test B. Please work. Hey, hey, there we go. Right, so then I would do that on the remaining four. I need to set my work plane there. And I might only just do this side for you so, so you don't have to watch me work here. Tab through to a reference line, that point to that point. Drag it off. And then where I let this thing snap to is, is crucial, right? So I don't want to snap to the previously made line. I want to snap to a line that I, I know was already working correctly. Eh, that should work. And then I'll check that side. And again, see, so everything is... Order operations is huge with this. Cancel that. Bring that down. To there. And lock it. And then hopefully, sometime today. Hey, hey, all right. So now I have my pieces, right? Let's say I had finished this whole truss. The last part of this would be then to sweep the geometry over this element, right? So I would say that I want to create a sweep, and I'm going to pick my path, which is that element, that element, that element, and that element, and that one. And then I check. And then I can sketch my profile or I can select the profile. So I can build a custom profile for my family. Let's go ahead and, and load a profile. So I'll click on load a profile. And I'm going to go down to structural framing. And I'll do steel. Maybe we want to load it with a... So we want to pick something that's a profile family, not, not a structural family. So I'll come down to profiles. And I should see uh, framing steel and then these are just two-dimensional segments that I can sweep around anything so I'll just do this rolled steel joist select one of them select the tiny one so I'm gonna edit profile Oop, cancel that select profile there and then it should be loaded now here that should load my my rolled section check and that's gonna sweep that geometry for me Right? So that's the whole purpose of this skeleton building, is now I can start loading multiple profiles. I can, I can, plug, it, I can plug and chug through this whole thing. I can, I can take that whole type li library and build a truss out now that matches that type library of elements. Right? So I would finish this geometry out with what I had built or built for this and say that I'm going to do another sweep. And in this case, pick my path here to there to there. And then I'll say that I'll do my same profile and check, right? So that builds it that way. And then, you know, there's always going to be edges you're going to want to think about and trim up. And then I can just blow through the rest of these. So I would say that I'm going to create um, another sweep, picking my path for each one of these. Check. Select my profile. So building the geometry is really the easy part. It's getting everything else flexing and moving on this, right? I would say these ones are going to go. And then the last one. Create my sweep. Check. 
right? And then I would fill in the gaps below there. So let's assume that that's my truss. Last thing before I load it into my project, I just want to do my test case A and case B to see that it is working. Click apply, click OK. So it is flexing, all the geometry works. The geometry was the easy part, right? So then I'll load that into my project. My family three, no, my project one. Okay, and then it's waiting for me to one, either draw the beam or put the beam into a system. So let's go ahead into a floor plan. And let's just change, I can change that beam now to be either test A or test B. But in this case, it's kind of being funny with me, so great. Test B, ah, you gotta be kidding me. And it's probably because it's snapped to that, that grid line, we really didn't set it up entirely correct. Um, let's go ahead and make the beam itself. And because we put the length on it, it doesn't have that variability. I have to actually put my variability into the type itself. That's why it's breaking is because the length's not determined by the system. It's determined by me um, solely. So I would think about maybe even making that in the beam family itself. Um, one thing I can do with that is I can load, I should be able to load that into a beam system. If not, you would do the same operation and just make it in the beam family, which is even more difficult than what we just went through. So let's just try a little, I have a feeling it's not gonna work. There. Then I'll say that I want, yeah. So that's what it was. So it definitely has to be in the beam system. So we tried, we didn't do it. So do it in the beam system. Family, if you want to make it in the beam system. If not, you have a one-off truss that you can control left, right, and top and bottom. So then, what time is it? It's, it's eight o'clock, right? So I think that's it for today. Um, what I want to do is I want to continue this. I don't know if I'll do it because we don't have class next week. So maybe that'll be a video that I do next week while you guys are either up there or I do it prior. But I want to do what she's working on on the McCormick Center. Right, so the McCormick Center is this giant big space frame. We've all seen that, right? The, the old, the first number of McCormick one by C.F. Murphy. So we want to do a system like that that works like this, but I want to basically draw with a line, kind of like I'm drawing a wall, and I'm drawing roofs called McCormick. So I can do multitudes of it. So that's what I want to do. I'm show you guys how to do the, that, thinking of a nested family and a line base. And then you will know how to do it. Okay? All right. All right, so we'll stop the video there. And then, so we'll take like five minutes and then I'll start coming around to people for questions.